Hello, I'm Julia George, and this is the Sunday Politics in the Southeast. Coming up later, do people on housing benefit make bad tenants? The biggest landlord in Kent, if not the country, evicts all his tenants who are on housing benefit. He says too many of them default on their rent. So is he a shrewd businessman or just totally heartless? With me in the studio today are Damien Collins, Conservative MP for Folkestone and Hythe, and Sarah Owen, who will stand for Labour at the general election in Hastings and Rye. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Now, before we look at people losing their homes through either flooding or eviction, I want to know what these two feel has rocked their political worlds in the past month. So we're going to keep it to something that's relevant here in the southeast, which frankly is most of the big stuff, immigration, fracking, airport expansion, or Sarah, maybe something entirely different. Well, I think in just before Christmas, it was particularly heartless of East Sussex County Council Conservatives to um, vote to get rid of two of our centres of excellence, care centres for dementia patients. Why does it matter? It matters incredibly because these are high quality care centres and we're losing not just experienced staff, but very vulnerable adults are being thrown into turmoil. Something very local to you yes. in Hastings. Amy Collins, what's been the big political issue for you in the last month or so? Well, we were told before Christmas that we would have uh, millions of Romanians and Bulgarians here by now. You keep saying that with this tidal wave was about to hit us, there were tens of thousands in Calais ready to pounce as soon as the new year struck. And that didn't happen at all. I think it's plenty of time yet. <laughs> well, I think it's demonstrated that you know far right parties use this sort of rhetoric, raising fears of foreigners. Uh, without any basis for it at all and I think it's been a disgrace and it's very interesting that it's not happened. Okay, you use the turn of phrase tidal wave, it might be relevant to the next story. Christmas was cancelled for an awful lot of people in Kent because of flooding. 700 homes inundated, elderly people trapped in their flats because of lifts breaking and in Yalding the water just kept rising until it reached well over a metre in the heart of the village. So was everything done that should have been? Sarah Neville reports. The southeast bore the brunt of the worst storms for 50 years. For many, Christmas was cancelled. You've worked in emergency planning. Did that look like a good example of a coordinated response to a serious flood? Short answer, no, it did not. And um, what those people there needed, of course, my, I echo Paul's sympathies to the people that have lost their homes and their businesses, but they actually don't need that, and they certainly don't need David Cameron turning up doing a publicity stunt three days later. What they need is proper defence systems in place, um, you needed David Cameron and I think the Conservatives and the Coalition Government to take responsibility for when you cut £500 million from the department responsible for flooding, that when things go wrong, that the plans won't be in place. OK, just a quick thought on what you saw in the film as well and, and whether it was a good example of a coordinated response. What do you say, Damien? Well, I, I don't think we said that from the film. And as Paul says, I mean, there has to be a proper study of what happened and what the lessons are to be learned. No, but the important thing is investment in the future. What people want to know is, is this going to happen again? We are spending more on flood defences now than the Labour Party was spending. And in the autumn statement, like at the end of last year, the government gave an extra £120 million okay. to go into flood defences as well. So but, people need to know that that investment is there. The government's expecting local authorities to come up with this when they are being... Uh, the, 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 the their funding is being capped by central government, they're being urged not to put council tax up. Where are they going to find the money to do that? And let me just bring in the point from Sir David King, the government's special envoy on climate change, says the government needs to double its spending on flood defences to a billion pounds a year by 2020. Meanwhile, the Environment Agency's budget is being cut. Well, the Environment Agency is there to deliver the flood defence work. They're the primary agency to do that. They've been given more money to do that, more money than the last government spent, and extra money this autumn as well. And there's a, so that yet the, the investment is going through. Mm -hmm. There's another, if I could finish, there's another key point as well, which is about local coordination. Now, uh, for me, my constituency, coastal flooding is the big concern. There's an excellent group which I work with, with Amber Rudd, the Hastings MP to support, called Defend Our Coast. They work throughout the year with the Environment Agency, with the councils, anticipating the problems, getting local agencies to coordinate throughout the year in anticipation of a problem. And I do think we need to look at that sort of grassroots planning in partnership with the councils and the Environment Agency as well. But it's not just the Environment Agency, Damien. I mean, we're looking at the response times there. People were very critical that you didn't see police, you didn't see the fire service, and there's two emergency services that are vital in flooding, well, and they've had their funding cut. Because you're the lead authority. Yeah. The county council officially is the lead authority responding to a flood. And you've heard the criticisms there. Is it too complicated? Uh, do we need well, a simpler system? That's not true. On Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, all the emergency 
emergency services, uh, Kent Fire and Rescue and the police were working and evacuating uh, people from the uh, caravan park uh, as well as uh, other homes and uh, uh, they saved lives alongside mm. uh, the volunteers uh, which were there in numbers. And, uh, 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 last week I met with St John's Ambulance, the Red Cross, they had an enormous number of volunteers help, and the Salvation Army helping and supporting uh, the evacuation and support process mm -hmm. and I think they did a marvellous job. Okay, well there will be lots of questions in the future about where we build houses which takes us on to our next issue. Paul Carter, thank you for joining us. Now you may have heard the name Fergus Wilson this week. He's one of Britain's biggest private landlords with over a thousand properties in Maidstone, Ashford and Hawkinge. Over the last year he's been busy evicting 200 individuals and families all for one reason. They're all on housing benefit. Here's his explanation. With our tenants who are working, in the last two years there's not been one who's defaulted. Whereas, as far as those on benefits are concerned, it's now over 50% default. They perhaps can't help it, but I'm not the DSS. Fergus Wilson, so is he the only private landlord who's avoiding tenants on welfare? Richard Lambert is from the National Landlords Association. Richard, are other private landlords increasingly turning away from tenants who were on benefits? I'm afraid they are. What we've seen over the past three years, the welfare reform agenda has progressed, is that benefit levels haven't kept up with rent levels. And so from our quarterly surveys of landlords, we found that the number uh, in 2010, the number saying that they would let to tenants on benefit or they were letting to tenants on benefit was about 46%. In our last survey in the third quarter of last year, that was down to 22%. So that's that, more than halved. Yeah, OK. So there really is a move away from wanting those people. And clearly there are other options. There's plenty of other people that these people can rent to. Absolutely. Remember that landlords will be thinking about risk. They will be wo worried about the fact that the tenant may not be able to pay the rent. If there's an adequate supply of tenants who are working and appear to be able to manage their resp financial responsibilities, then they're the ones that the landlord is going to look to first because they'll simply want less hassle. OK, but you talk about the, the, the rent moving away, distancing itself from housing benefit. If housing benefit isn't keeping up with rents, then it's people like Fergus Wilson who are to blame. Why do they keep putting the rents up? That's a complete misnomer. Housing benefit does not drive rent. The housing market drives rents. I didn't say housing benefit drives rent. I said the gap between the two is caused by rents going up. So why do landlords keep putting rents up? Rents go up because there's a shortage of supply of housing. There are lots of people looking for housing. And inevitably... Or if indeed not because landlords are greedy. No, it's not. It's because there is a shortage of supply and because the people are bidding the price up. The, the, if you look across the housing market, all forms of housing are increasing in price. Unfortunately, because the benefits are being held back, they're not keeping up with the market demand, and so people who are reliant on benefit uh, are being put in a more and more difficult position. Richard Lambert, thank you very much for joining us. Let's find out what our guests of the day think about this. Fergus Wilson, Sarah, a businessman who's ended up, as he told me on BBC Radio Kent this week, £800,000 down because of rent arrears. It's just business, isn't it? I don't think anyone's going to be crying over Fergus Wilson's bank account at any stage. Um, I totally disagree with what Fergus Wilson and what um, some of that landlord was saying earlier. There's this rhetoric, and I have to say the Conservatives are heavily to blame for this, that people on housing benefit aren't in work. In actual fact, seven out of eight people in receipt of housing benefit are actually working people that just cannot make ends meet. And this is about a cost of living crisis. And particularly in the South East, where we've seen wages fall by £2,000 pounds over the last three years. Damien, Sarah's got a point. Let's be clear, this is a man with multiple millions who will evict tenants in work, whether they are in arrears or not, merely on the basis that they are in receipt of housing benefit. Do you condone that? No, not at all. I mean, I, I don't at all. I mean, he ultimately is a private landlord. You know, he has, he has the right to do that. I think what landlords should care about is the quality of their tenants. There are good tenants and bad tenants uh, across the board, of people of all income scales. What good landlords want is uh, are good tenants. I think we have to look very seriously at the way certain private landlords behave. My bigger concern is actually, you know, less maybe Fergus Wilson, but some of the rogue and absentee private landlords that keep their properties mm. in a shocking state and abuse their tenants, knowing that their tenants, certainly but that vulnerable you know people, what? won't do very much about it. The people he's evicting are going to end up renting from those people. Well, what we need, and I do, I do think the Landlords Association is right in this regard, is more supply. Uh, I think we desperately need to get more houses built for social tenants, built by housing associations, 
you know, in East Kent, we're seeing East Kent housing building effectively new council houses. I think we need to see more of that. Just not on floodplains, right? Well, I think you know we, where where they can be sensitively built. Okay. There is there is land where they can be built, but we do need more supply. That gives tenants more choice and more power. Right, that's too. one of the options. Let, let's, if we can, rattle through some of the options to try and solve this problem here. Um, Okay, one of the options is to increase housing benefit. You've got rents at a certain level. This guy doesn't think that housing benefit is enough to cover it. Damien Collins, I don't even need to ask you that question because I know this government believes that housing benefit and the bill for to, to the taxpayer needs to come down. Is there an argument that housing benefit should be higher, Sarah? <laughs> well, we've, as, as both parties, all cross parties, have agreed that there is a housing benefit cap. Um, and I think that we've got to look a lot bigger at the issue. And I've touched on it with the cost of living crisis. Okay, it's not just, there are right. 23,000 we... people in Hastings that are currently in debt mm. and those people well, let, are hold on. Working, I will come so on to that not, but I just want yeah. a quick answers on this so housing benefit is a no we're not going to increase it what about paying rent direct to the landlord that was a change that came in last year under this government and it's one that we've said if there are issues and there are obviously issues of concerns with landlords and tenants at the moment that it needs to be constantly reviewed what well, do you say, Dan? we can uh, we can look at direct pay payments to landlords uh, if, if the landlords are good landlords I, I think it should be used as an incentive for where the landlord is keeping their property at a decent level that they can mm. require it there are all also through credit unions, special accounts that people can have set up whereby their rent is ring-fenced to go to the landlord. Actually good social tenants are good tenants because effectively the state is providing a large part of their, their rent guaranteed mm. through housing benefits. So yeah. and many landlords are happy to work okay. with housing tenants okay. for that reason. The, the other point that the, that the Landlords Association wasn't keen to look at was rents being controlled. I, I mean just because how the price of houses goes up, you don't have to put your rents up, do you? Do we need to start controlling rents? Well, I, I, I don't think we, I mean, you're going back to the 1970s, really, you know, those sorts of rent controls, that's not going to work. I mean, if, if rents are going up too much, it's because there's too many people chasing properties, there's not enough properties for them, therefore you need more supply rent in the controls, system. I think, I think that's not necessarily true to say it doesn't work. It works in places like New York City, for example, where um, um, rent and property prices are incredibly high. Mm. And if you look at the South East, it's a particularly acute problem here. And in places like Hastings and in Rye, where we've got very low wages, yeah. but you're getting property prices creeping up and up. People okay. are being priced out the market completely. We've already talked about building more homes. Mm. Um, there's obviously the issue of higher wages. But look, let, let's just come back down to what this means for a community. It's a brand of social cleansing, isn't it, to say poorer people are not welcome in these homes. Do you see it in that, there in that are, way? There are, there are things that we are doing now to, to, stem this, um, to stem this problem. Hastings Borough Council has run a very successful local authority mortgage scheme to get people that can afford to buy out of, um, out but of you, the rental but you, market I really do to want to come back to these hmm. decisions by tenants. I mean, it is important to think that some people will have to rent, probably for all their lives. Do you see it as social cleansing, Dave? Uh, well, well no, I mean, you, you look at the actions of one private landlord, you know, he may have a lot of properties scattered over an area. You have to look at the, the whole mix. We want mixed communities, we want people... But we have the Landlords Association say more and more of them feel like that. No, but what we need is, as, as they said, is, is more supply in the market. Then you give tenants more, more choice, they've got more power as a result of it. We also need to be doing more through help to buy, through the right to buy schemes as well, to help people who are long-term tenants mm. to actually buy their home rather than renting. OK, thank you both very much indeed. It's time now for a round-up of the other political events you might have missed this week. Here's James Fitzgerald. It's an unhappy new year for the Chatham Historic Dockyard. Its second bid to be the UK's next candidate for UNESCO World Heritage status failed this week as the government instead opted to put forward the Lake District National Park. The annual rail fare increase may have been less hard-hitting than usual, but rail bosses have been accused of daylight robbery for above inflation rises to car parking charges. In Haywards Heath, an annual ticket is over £1,100 a 5% increase. It's a double whammy for the uh, poor hard-pressed commuters. Kent's new Chief Constable Alan Pusley has his work cut out. One of his first jobs is to further reduce his forces budget by £20 million, which he reckons could equate to 100 officer jobs. I will take as much of that money out of uh, non-people savings as I possibly can. January bargain hunters could do worse than head to deal, which won the Telegraph's High Street of the Year award for its strong regeneration and array of independent retailers.
Lots of people will feel quite aggrieved by that double whammy of the increase in parking charges at railway stations. We've got, in Kent, we've got some of the first £5,000 commutes from towns like Ramsgate and Dover. Um, I don't know what the journey up from Hastings is. Do you it's got around, a figure for it? It's around the 5000 mark now, yes. It's a lot of money. 5% increase in parking. Can that be justified to charge people that much more for their parking on top of their <laughs> rail fares? I mean, we've just talked about the cost of living crisis and people being priced out of their own homes, and now we're seeing people being priced out of public transport, which completely negates the point of it. The the problem, of course, that it causes, Damon, is people go and park on nearby residential mm. streets to avoid it. That's not good for anyone, is no, it? I mean, you should look at, look at it across the round. We do actually in Kent have some of the lowest priced uh, rail, uh, railway station car parks uh, that are covered at all by the South East, uh, South Eastern Trains mm. franchise. So historically, the prices have been kept quite low. Uh, and the price increases this year, whilst we would rather see a freeze or a cut, it was the lowest for a number mm. of years. And I think it shows that with the government support, the rail companies okay. are keeping the prices lower. All right. Thank you both very much indeed. Nice to have you with us. That's all we've got time for from the South East this week. My guests were Damien Collins and Sarah Owen. And Natalie will be here next week. More politics from the South East. See you soon.